Hey everybody, Sean Tierney here from the Automation Blog and School. And in this episode of the Automation Podcast, I sit down with Yasser Rizwan from LabForge to learn about their new cameras, their vision systems that have like leading edge features you're not going to find in any other cameras, as well as deep learning AI. Yasser, thank you for coming on the Automation Podcast to tell us all about LabForge. Before we jump into your presentation, can you just give us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Hi, Sean. Uh, thank you for having me um, on your podcast today. LabForge is a Waterloo-based company, and uh, we design, develop, and sell smart cameras. I am the CEO of LabForge. Uh, my name is Yasser Rizwan, and uh, I started this company together with my co-founders, uh, Thomas and Sebastian, about eight years ago. So uh, we've been uh, in Waterloo for some time and uh, focusing on uh, machine vision and camera products. And, uh, you know, uh, we are... Uh, we have lots of applications in industrial automation, and we thought we would take uh, the, the time that you gave us today to just you know go through some of the some of those applications. Uh, when we talk about industrial automation and cameras, uh, you know, as you know very well, Sean, you know, uh, this industry has been there for a long time, uh, probably two or three decades that uh, cameras have been used in uh, in the industrial automation. Um, it's probably um, fair to say that there have been different eras of machine vision uh, where products could do some stuff before and uh, now they do a whole uh, different uh, set of things, right? So the cameras have evolved quite a bit and there's new uh, computer vision and AI technology in the market and uh, and in the labs in a uh, constant evolution of algorithms that, that make um, a lot Lot of stuff possible um, and so we can talk about that today so uh, when we talk about challenges in the industrial automation segment uh, there are, uh, there are four challenges that we are addressing as a company and uh, the first one is lighting and cameras being a visual sensor um, uh, that can plug into a PLC or in or an industrial PC and uh, can issue commands to do different things like run conveyor belts or uh, eject a uh, eject a product from the conveyor line if it's not good um, but because they're visual uh, it, it's all based on what they can see so uh, suffice to say right that if you can't see something you know, the camera is really kind of pointless there um, when it comes to imaging objects that are uh, bright, uh, like for example, like this welding image that you see on the screen, or uh, let's say objects that have a lot of shadows uh, from being uh, from having contoured geometry, or let's say um, you have a conveyor belt that has um, objects that are wrapped in plastic, like um, you know, a, a lot of companies use um, the cling film, uh, plastic film to wrap final products, and that's very shiny and can reflect the lights from your ceiling directly into the camera. And uh, sometimes you're in a factory that has um, uh, an open window or uh, ceiling, um, you know, skylights, right? And so the sun can come into the factory and problems like these can happen once in a while, right? So for example, the machine vision system could break once every two months and it will be very difficult to diagnose and maybe it turns, and we heard this story from someone and it turns out that once every two months, the sun just lines up to the skylight in a way that it just breaks the machine vision cameras that are looking at the, the product. So we address lighting uh, in a specific way. So we'll go into that in a, in a second. The next big uh, problem is detection, right? So detection, recognition, identification. Uh, these are all names and they mean slightly different things in different industries. But uh, let's say that our problem is to detect uh, the product uh, on a conveyor belt, or let's say our problem is to detect uh, defects on a product, um, or maybe we're just tracking our throughput. You know, we're just seeing how many donuts we are making every day, and um, the method of detection has evolved over the number of years. So before, it used to be that you had to train a specific classifier, and you had to uh, you had to have a camera in the right geometry and the right orientation, and it was a very constrained classifier that that could see. Um, let, let's say, for in this example, donuts at a very specific angle, and uh, and if it deviates from the geometry even a little bit, it would have trouble understanding that it's a donut and not just part of a of the conveyor array. Right? The new algorithms uh, with AI um, and the deep learning, um, uh, uh, probably a more appropriate word for it, but deep learning based classifiers, um, those are a lot more versatile and uh, they are able to detect things with a lot more variation, but you can also train them to pick out flaws at a much more efficient manner. Right? The, the challenge though, is that these new algorithms are extremely heavy and 
require a lot of computing power uh, to be deployed at the factory, and it may not be possible to do that for every single camera uh, that you may have on the line. The next challenge is localization, and uh, this happens for fixed robotic arms as well as uh, for AGVs or AMRs, like uh, uh, UGVs and AMRs, so like unmanned guided vehicles, uh, autonomous mobile robots, even the robotic arms. The challenge here is that do we really know the exact position uh, we are at relative to the world, and um, can we? What do we do uh, if we don't know that position? Right. So, for example your encoders can only do so much. And um, let's say you have a robotic arm and it's on some sort of uh, conveyor, right? So it's moving and the conveyor could have some backlash. So while your robotic arm may have really good encoders and you would you could derive the position of the end effector uh, by doing some uh, kinematic math, uh, I think is the word. Um, but if there's any backlash in any of the gears on let's say the conveyor belt or something that's moving that arm, then that becomes a very tough problem. But it is something that is with, well within the purview of computer vision uh, to be able to find out where you are relative to the world. And then the last challenge uh, that we are addressing is mapping. Is OK, so let's say we figured out where our robot is, and we've, uh, so, I mean, almost sort of, right? And then we've kind of figured out what we want to detect, and we figured out a lighting problem. Mapping is the, the other big thing that we want to do is uh, basically um, find a 3D geometry or find the actual uh, locations of all these different products around us. And maybe if it's a moving robot, maybe we want to find where the obstacles are so that the UGV or the AMR can guide its way through the factory. Maybe it's carrying uh, a bumper of a car from one part of the factory to the other. Uh, but then there could also be other challenges. For example, for a uh, for an end effector, maybe an automotive plant, maybe it just wants to map how well the uh, the part of the subframe of the car is placed in front of it so that it can um, accurately bring in the windshield and sort of install the windshield right on the car. Right? That That is a very good mapping challenge. Is let's map where this car is, where's the socket that the robot has to put this uh, windshield into. So some possible solutions to all four of these things uh, is that, you know, yes, we can always increase the horsepower on the industrial computer to run the complex algorithms. Um, uh, the number number two would be, can we shift some of the front-end computer vision processing to the cameras themselves? Or number three would be, can we shift all the processing to individual cameras to solve some of these, uh, to solve some of these challenges? And none of these methods is, you know, generally speaking, uh, better than the other. It's, it's usually a preference and it's a, it's a matter of what fits in the budget and uh, what the customer uh, uh, is looking for at the site, right? When you're increasing the horsepower on the industrial computer, um, as, as your audience is probably well aware, right? Like the industrial PCs that can probably interface with cameras come in all sorts of sizes and shapes. And you can go the low end where it'll be a low cost computer, but then it can't really run that many of the new algorithm. So you're probably left with the old school classifiers, uh, maybe not deep learning based classifiers, or um, maybe um, maybe all it can do is uh, you know just do basic identification of numbers or some OCR to recognize some text, right? But you do have the ability to supersize that industrial computer and uh, uh, add all kinds of hardware inside it. So you could add uh, you know GPUs and FPGAs inside it or some other accelerator inside it because CPUs these days are just not good enough for AI, right? So if you're just running an Intel or um, or an AMD processor in there, um, uh, that that in itself is not good enough to run some of the cutting edge uh, software that we now have available. The second uh, idea would be to do some partial, you know, like let's say we have a, we still have a computer or a, or a next generation PLC and is doing some sort of computer vision, but then we also have some of the most regularly used computer vision front end tasks, and maybe we put those onto the camera itself. Right? So, um, in our industry, those would be feature detection is one of the one of the basic ones. Then there's uh, tracking, um, the calculation of dense depth. Uh, can only be done in so many ways. And so that could be something you could put on the camera itself. And then, of course, the AI and, uh, and high dynamic range imaging. And what this allows then is uh, uh, this allows you to buy a camera that can do front end processing on the device. And then you can, uh, the, the factory or the automation integrator can keep the proprietary algorithms on that central node or on that industrial computer, right? So um, it makes the, makes it, it's a nice middle compromise. Uh, on the uh, choices that we have. 
The third option is to shift everything to a to an individual camera, right? There, here we, uh, we we could say, okay, so we're installing this smart camera, and because it's smart, we're just going to connect this directly to a solenoid, and there's going to be no computer between it. And the challenge with, uh, and that's a very good method too. Uh, but uh, again, the, the challenges are now you have you're limited to how much you can scale this uh, because when you buy that smart camera, it comes with so much compute power. And after that, uh, if you want it anymore, you're you're out of luck. And number three, or uh, the second uh, problem with this approach is also that the each of every smart camera, including the ones we make, come with their own niche architecture and uh, their own niche way to accelerate things and maybe their own little programming languages uh, enhancements and, and other things and so it, uh, it may not be in the best interest of the automation integrator to port all of their algorithms to a niche platform and then be uh, sort of locked in there right and uh, not be able to expand out of that so the approach that we've taken with LaughForge uh, line of products is the is the middle approach. Is uh, we, we're we're advocating that some of the processing uh, be shifted into the camera, but not all of the processing be shifted into the camera, giving the customers the ability to stay agile and uh, and uh, allowing them to be able to port things uh, between vendors uh, from the uh, industrial computer side, and uh, also to maintain the software, which is their own proprietary algorithms, uh, and then they never have to show us. What those algorithms are because that's on a separate computer so they don't need our help uh, in order to do that any questions so far sean no that all made a lot of sense and i like how you went through that cool thank you so now i wanted to introduce um then within that middle segment that we're doing i wanted to introduce the two main uh, uh main products that, uh, that we have available uh, one is the bottlenose uh, which is a um, a smart camera that, that can do some of the more front-end processing for you. And uh, uh, these cameras come with AI, computer vision, and HDR. And uh, then we have a second product, which is the ICTN, which is an abbreviation for in um, Integrated Classification and Tracking Network. And that product is basically, you know, if you can imagine having lots of smart cameras, um, you know, is there um, information to be gained if these are smart cameras were working together? And there are things that lots of smart cameras can see and understand if they were working together that a single smart camera may not be aware of. And if the cameras are allowed to share that information, not and we're not talking just sharing as in just, just connect a network and we're done, no. But we're, we're talking about sharing the actual information that is being generated, like the metadata, the results of the feature detection and AI. Can we share that data across the network and across the cameras? And then can they come up with a result that is better than an individual camera. So that product is the ICTN, and the core technology behind it that we've developed is multi-sensor, multi-target tracking uh, that has many use cases as well in industrial automation. So uh, the, the, the main use cases for both of these products is, uh, uh, as I mentioned, is detection, localization, and 3D mapping. So that's the, the crux of, of a lot of these things. And uh, we've we'll mentioned some examples on how you would apply it to robotic arms, uh, unmanned guided vehicles, as well as, as well as AMRs that are very popular uh, these days. And um, of course, you can also do the applications uh, that, uh, that industrial automation you know, customers have been doing for a while, which is to monitor and analyze parts let's say on a conveyor belt um, or complex defect analysis. Um, now you can do very good defect analysis with AI and deep learning. So but the industry is, uh, or the at least on the computer vision research side, you can detect things now that are, um, you know, almost at a superhuman type level, being able to detect defects in things and uh, things that, uh, that defy logic sometimes, right? It's sometimes hard to understand why AI is, uh, is uh, is being able to is able to do it better than a human, but it's really all about what kind of data set you're provided and how you're training uh, the uh, the deep learning algorithms. And the the next one is a, is a, you know Sean mentioned it last time when we were talking, which is the tagless tracking of consumables on a pallet. So, like for example, if you had the ability to track things across a floor on a factory, um, and you didn't need to put any tags on it or barcodes or uh, or even um, RFID tags, uh, then what could you use that for? So, one of the examples could be, hey, you know, could we track things that are being used? So, for example, liquids, uh, maybe some powder uh, that is being used in food manufacturing, or it could be ore that is used in metal manufacturing. Um, any anything that is very difficult to put a sticker on and, uh, and track through, right? And we can do that with a uh, with our ICTN product, which is a network of cameras that you can lay across your factory, and we will track it from the start till the end until the pallet is pretty much empty. 
So the first one is bottlenose, and uh, this is our stereo camera, uh, very um, high performance stereo camera, essentially. We have four main things here that we do. And uh, so the first one is depth computation. And depth computation is essentially the way or a method for cameras to figure out the volume that they're looking at, right? And it works very similar to how the two eyes that we have are able to uh, figure out how far certain things are. The the limits of uh, being able to do depth detection like this is uh, is uh, is the baseline between your two eyes, right? So so we lose our human depth perception is lost at a few meters after the eyes, and that's because our eyes are only so many uh, millimeters apart from each other. So same holds true for bottlenose as well. And uh, but what we do have is uh, is 4K and 8 megapixel imagery on both cameras, the left camera and the right camera, and then we compare the left image with the right image, and we figure out what the disparity is between those two images. And that tells us what the depth is. The leading cameras in the market for depth are, uh, as far as we've found so far, are all capped at about 36 megapixels per second in terms of how much depth they can compute on the device itself. And after that, it just kind of, you know, but that's it. That's the limit of the silicon that they have in there. Uh, whereas for bottlenose, we're at 200 megapixels per second. That means that we can do 200 megapixels of imagery from the left and right. Um, cameras uh, and compare them and do the full computer vision algorithms on it at 200 megapixels per second of uh, throughput. And the next one is AI. And uh, so here we have about two gigabytes to four gigabytes of LPDDR4 uh, high speed RAM baked into the camera itself. And uh, we have uh, about two and a half teraops of processing power. And the great thing here is that uh, compared to other um, smart cameras in the market, this one doesn't force you to quantize or prune uh, or compress your neural network. And uh, so quantization, pruning, and compression uh, is, uh, is a method to reduce, like, let's say, a 150 megabyte network, um, deep learning network, into four megabytes. And, uh, and that allows you to run uh, the algorithms on a, uh, on a resource-constrained smart cameras. Whereas in bottlenose, we haven't really put that restriction on a on the customer so they could run a full scale without compressing it uh, a full scale neural network directly onto the camera and for that you need a lot of ram and so that's why we've provided uh, the lpddr4 at two gigabytes four gigabytes together with the compute and uh, and also the ability for the two and a half teraops of compute power to talk to the ram in a very high speed back and forth way because they have to exchange a lot of data uh, when they're trying to uh, uh, detect what's in the image all right, I got a couple of questions here. I, I think we're all familiar with uh, DDR memory. What's LP DDR? Oh, uh, LP is low power. Oh, and uh, okay. yeah, low power DDR is a very pervasive and pretty much everywhere, even you have it on your desk right now on your cell phone. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then the, uh, you know, I, th I think most of us have heard of teraflops before. <laughs> um, so w explain tops again a little bit. Sure. Yeah, TOPS is as as you mentioned, it's a a, a, a close cousin of teraflops. Mm -hmm. uh, so teraops is basically tera operations per second. Okay. Whereas teraflops is tera floating point operations per second. Okay. Right. So yeah, and usually computers you can use teraflops or teraops depending on what your base uh, computation um, bit uh, bit width is. I think if I'm using the correct grid. So if you're an 8-bit machine or a 16 or a floating point machine, then you can use uh, teraflops, yeah. Here we have a combination. Uh, okay. So for example, the um, the uh, the AI is actually being done partly in full floating points, mm -hmm. whereas the I believe the depth computation is being done in integer land. So then using teraops across is OK. Makes sense. And then uh, we also have the ISP. So ISP is the image signal processor. And uh, so that's also an industry term. Uh, uh, all the machine vision cameras that you would buy off the shelf with uh, Gigi interfaces all have ISPs. Most of them actually have ISPs on them. Uh, all that means is that it's a, it's a dedicated part of the processor that's included on the cameras that is uh, whose task is to grab the image uh, and pipe it across uh, something else. And so and ISPs can, be, uh, can go from doing pretty much nothing which is just, okay, I'm gonna grab my raw image from the image sensor and I'm gonna put it in RAM. And then from the RAM, my processor will take it and it will pipe it over Gigi and into the other side uh, that is consuming Gigi uh, camera images. 
that's pretty standard for uh, for industrial automation. But here we have a very uh, supercharged ISP. It's almost like having a full Photoshop almost on your camera, right? So we have nine teraops of processing power just dedicated to image signal processing. And what that allows us is to cater to that challenge that we talked first, which is the lighting problem. And you know, you've got plastic wrapped items, you've got skylights, you've got fluorescent lights, you've got uh, reflections coming from aluminum, CNC to aluminum parts, you've got water bottles that are reflecting random stuff. So if you have a lighting problem in your imagery, then you need some sort of high dynamic range imaging. And high dynamic range imaging, short form HDR, is the ability for a camera to understand super dark and super bright things at the same time. Um, and for the for an image uh, to, have, to be high dynamic range means that that one image that we have has the ability to be encoded from all the way from um, being very dark to being super bright. And so if let's say your image is eight bits and uh, uh, then you know you don't really have that much high dynamic range because eight bits means that every pixel can only have 256 values. Um, I hope I did that right. Yeah, I think it's 256. So uh, you know, when you go HDR, you need a camera that is able to take all these images and then compress them um, into uh, a single image. So what we do is here, we take an image at high exposure then we take an image at low exposure and we take an image in between and then we merge it into our high dynamic range imaging and normally you can do this on a computer and uh, it will take quite a bit of processing power to do a single image but we're doing hdr imaging uh, in real time uh, on the camera itself for every single image that's coming out right and we're talking like a few frames per second whatever that fps requirement is from the customer it's happening at that rate and it's uh, it's able to provide you with uh, with the hdr imagery and this is just a front end, right? So you can use this for all kinds of things. Let's say you have a problem reading OC, uh, reading text on a part on your conveyor belt because the part is metal and it's uh, shiny, and uh, you know you have a little bit of text on there. That's hard to that's hard to do. And uh, but if you have HDR, then you you're you're getting an image that basically has the dark parts, which is your little font and the little print that you put in there. And then also the super bright parts, which is the little curve inside, let's say your disc break or your drum break, and it's kind of reflecting the environment back into your camera. So you can have all of that in there, and then you can use the AI to detect um, the, the barcode that's in there. LTM is just another process uh, that's after HDR, which is called local tone mapping. So it's another image processing term. And uh, it's again, uh, uh, it's required to get basically a high dynamic range image out of the system. Then the, the next piece that we have in there is uh, is point cloud generation. And uh, this is what we what we talked about earlier when we were when we discussed the localization problem is uh, hey, you know, do we know where the robot is and uh, where is it in, in the real world, right? Like could we have a a, a, a precise ability to understand um, relative to some origin could be a could be a very uh, randomly defined origin of zero 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 x y z. But now, do I know where I am with from that origin? Uh, you can use the point cloud that we can generate on this camera to then track yourself uh, going from one place to the other. And uh, you know, uh, you can imagine many different ways to use this. So, for example, let's say you put this on an end effector, and the end effector itself is holding a bottlenose camera. Then, as the end effector moves. Um, this this point cloud can then be used on your industrial PC to then come up with a full um, uh, odometry of your movement of the end effector. And then if you mix that with your encoders, you're you're even better. But you don't even have to. You know, you would we get a pretty good position just from that. Could you talk about point clouds just a little bit more? Because I just just so that everybody's listening and watching has an idea of what you're talking about there. So point clouds uh, in general are the ability for computers to represent 3D information. And uh, so let's say I'm looking at the uh, at my room right now, and let's say I have a point for the window, and you know there's a few points on the window, there's a few points on the TV screen, a few points on the couch, and uh, then when I'm trying to let's say I import these points into a CAD software. Right, like let's say I put it into SolidWorks. Now in SolidWorks, I don't really care what the couch looks like or what the window looks like. I just want these points in SolidWorks at scale, right? Or in um, or in any other CAD viewing software, I want them to be at scale to be located where I thought these points were. And when I rotate it around, I sort of see basically the geometry of my room, and I can measure things 
on them, right? And the representation, the 3D representation doesn't have any surfaces. So normally, like let's say you model something um, and you're drawing a CAD model of it, you would have surfaces and there would be a full dense information about it. Point clouds is, is a way to get that same 3D information, but in a sparse way. So only the important points have their 3D information. So uh, yeah, actually this is a great next slide because I just mentioned a dense way, right? And then I also mentioned a sparse way. So this is sort of like in the middle. This is the a dense, um, this is a dense point cloud. You can also have a sparse point cloud, but this is a dense point cloud. And you can see um, this is an example because everybody's working from their homes these days. So this is an example of our backyard, um, of one of our pe people's backyards. And it's showing what bottlenose we'll see uh, when you point it at like your sort of like your uh, backyard furniture and a tree, right? Now I could go in there into the viewing software and I could rotate this area and I could see the tree from the side, for example, right? And I could measure how big that trunk is um, and, or I can measure how large these chairs are. And you can sort of imagine if this, this system or, or uh, if this data was being generated in real time and uh, you didn't have to provide all the processing power required to generate this, which because this is all done on the camera, uh, then you know possibilities are endless, right? You could put it on a robot arm, you could put it on a moving robot, you can put it on a conveyor belt, uh, you could just have it fixed, attached to something and just uh, figuring out the 3D information of what's happening around you. Another industry that uses this, which I think your users might be familiar with, is the 3D scanning industry. Uh, 3D scanning takes this a whole step further where you know they will promise, uh, I think, micrometer level um, recreations of what you're scanning. So let's say uh, a part falls off the industrial automation line and I kind of want to uh, I, I want to see is this transmission mold or a cast, let's say this transmission cast, is this made to the right um, spec, right? Like uh, I designed this in CAD. Does this, uh, is, does this cast look like what I designed in CAD? Then you would use a 3D scanner to basically scan that whole thing, then feed it back into your CAD software to figure out if the as-built is as good as the other one. Now, Bottlenose doesn't do that uh, because that, that, that is a separate industry on itself, like the 3D scanning industry. And uh, those cameras are extremely expensive. They are um, pretty much uh, one or two orders of magnitude more expensive than a Bottlenose. And they're not meant to be used uh, for production, right? You're doing one-off. Uh, non-destructive testing. So it's it's a different use case. The bottlenose you can put on a production line. Yeah, and what this reminds me, and for the audio audience, um, you know, if you've ever watched any of the recent Tesla, um, you know, automatic driver type of presentations, it reminds yes. me much of that kind of point cloud where it's not a super defined, you know, the, the road and the side of the road is defined enough so the car doesn't hit things, but it's not defined so much where, you know, you could read the license plate or, or make out a face. That is that is correct. A very similar technology too from Tesla. Tesla is also using just cameras, right? They're very much mm -hmm. uh, not using lidars. Uh, lidars are a whole other way to do the same thing. But basically, you know, you, uh, Tesla is using cameras. They're coming up with a point cloud. The point cloud is good enough to drive. Yeah, so right. you don't hit something. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So the next example here, again, this is our backyard. This is actually the backyard of our office here. Uh, but these are the examples of, you know, we were just showing what, what we can do outside, but you can still take this on um, uh, inside a factory and do pretty much the same thing. Here, we've trained the cameras to detect uh, people, dogs, and cars. And so here, the bottomless system is using a very high-end um, YOLO v3 AI algorithm. And YOLO is... Um, uh, it, it stands for you only look once. Okay. Um, in this in this case, it doesn't stand for you only live once. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so YOLO is an algorithm that, like I was mentioning before, AI industry is moving at a very fast pace, right? And uh, new methods of recognizing things are coming out daily, and there's thousands of papers being written on this every year now. And in fact, if you don't if you don't keep up with it, you're pretty much certain that your stuff is going to fall behind, right? So Yolo V3 was a researcher at a university. I forget the name, but uh, PJ Reddy is the name of the guy who came up with it. And uh, uh, at the time, that algorithm only ran on a giant computer. Like you would need a full GPU desktop and you would need a CPU and then it would be connected to a camera and then it would run this thing, right? Uh, the difference here is that we've, uh, we've taken Yolo V3 and now it's running on bottlenose itself. Right? And YOLO v3 is a very versatile neural network. So you could, for example, take the YOLO v3 that we could provide you that we have trained ourselves, and you could show it 10,000 images of a, let's say, a defect on a on a tire. Mm -hmm. 
right? And after that, it will it will it will find that defect by itself. Uh, you can also uh, train it for for many, and you don't even need some. Many times you don't need ten thousand images. You can have give it very few images. Uh, we've we've managed to train Yolo V three to actually detect a very small drone in the sky with many different kinds of backgrounds, and we were able to get very good results from that as well. And uh, Back in the day, it used to be that a classifier had to be very stringent. You know, like you had to look at that part from a certain angle with the right lighting and everything, and yeah. only then would you detect that defect that's coming in, right? But uh, algorithms like Yolo V3, these networks are extremely versatile, and uh, it's really possibilities are endless. Um, I, I could train this, for example, uh, if if a customer came in and said, "Well, you know, I have a um, a factory that makes, um, uh, let's say, coffee cups." Right, and we want to detect coffee cups in different orientations. Like we're not going to position that cup in a certain way so that the uh, the edge that you hold uh, is going to be perfectly perpendicular to the camera. And so while that would not have been possible with older classifiers, now it's possible. So we can take their coffee cup, uh, we can take a few hundred images of it, and then you know two days probably is all it will take to now have the bottlenose camera be detecting coffee cups on that conveyor belt. Yeah, I like to, you know, when people ask about this, it's, I like to say it's similar to how you train your, your fingerprint sensor on your phone, where <laughs> you, you put your finger over it a few different ways, you move it around, and eventually it has enough pictures of your fingerprint to, yeah. you know, however you grab your phone, it'll detect your fingerprint, uh, unless you're like me, and then you hold it weird, and it doesn't, but, <laughs> and, and this is, this is what you're doing, you're training it to to you know the park doesn't always have to be perfect in the perfect lighting you yes. it has a wider range the park can be in different positions and the lighting can change a little bit more and you can still detect that defect which i think is i mean it's definitely the future the future is here now with with being able to do this in your cameras no exactly and and in the same way that you just mentioned your fingerprints uh you know uh people detection used to be the same way too in the even in, on the cars, some of the cars on the road today that have those ADAS systems, which mm -hmm. is a, a advanced driver assistance systems, right? That are looking forward from your windshield. Some of them still have the older classifiers on them. So if this person over here was to just sit down, uh, it won't be able to detect them, mm -hmm. right? And some of those cameras actually do come with warnings that hey, this camera was trained for an upright uh, upright pedestrian in this kind of orientation. If you can see my mouse but not in this orientation where a person is walking sideways or just sitting down, right? So that's such a basic thing. Uh, but YOLO, like, you know, these new new AI and deep learning algorithms, yeah, they, it has no problem. If this person was to even lie down here, we would be able to detect them. Mm -hmm. And so this is an example of a feature point detection system. And a feature point detection is one of the most uh, fundamental things in computer vision and uh, what it, uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure what the exact definition is, but uh, the way I like to describe feature detection is, hey, here's an image, and an image is composed of, let's say, all these pixels. Like, let's say, you know, each of these images is say, eight megapixels. So let's say uh, the right image is eight, eight megapixels. That means that we have eight million pixels, right? And can we find a few pixels that are interesting? So out of the eight million, can we find a hundred? Can we find a thousand that are interesting? And so that's what we call feature point detection. And so there's corner detection algorithms and other algorithms that will find out features that are worth keeping uh, taking a look at. And some of these features are uh, are good to track. There's actually an algorithm from the 90s, I think, or the early 2000s called Good Features to Track. It's called GFTT. And GFTT is uh, also a fundamental algorithm that's used in many computer vision and machine vision systems. And uh, and we have that on bottomless as well. And uh, we take it a step further by creating a feature descriptor. So uh, let's say we found the corner feature, which is a, a, a good feature that we want to be able to track across images between left and right or or, or across time. The feature descriptor is a method to find the fingerprint of that feature. So the, the fingerprint of, let's say, one of these pink features is different from one of these green features, right? And if we have a fingerprint of that feature, then we can find it again on another image that we take from a completely different angle or on the, uh, or, or on the image from the say, taken from the same angle, but maybe after like a, a few seconds, right? And uh, by, by being able to match the signatures or the fingerprints of these features across time or across space allows us to then uh, figure out what the location is of the camera and, and many other applications too. And so that's also being accelerated on the bottomless device. 
And the cool thing here is that we can do all of these things at the same time. And that's also one of the uh, diff uh, a key differentiating factor of our smart camera versus other cameras out there is that if you wanted to, you could do HDR, you could do the dense depth, the YOLO V3, the Akaze, all of these things together. Um, you just have to kind of configure it um, from your computer and it will, be out it will output all of that information. We also have uh, on, on the bottlenose device itself, uh, you know, uh, it's a stereo camera. So the two image sensors that we have are both time synchronized um, uh, to real time. And in between, we have an inertial measurement unit. And uh, that IMU has um, gyroscopes, accelerometers on it. And so uh, those are also time stamped in real time with the images that we're taking. And that data together is again, very useful for uh, modern machine vision and robotic systems. So the last point here that I would like to mention is the scalability. So when we're doing this kind of processing and we, we have, uh, you know, almost supercomputer actually, you know, pretty much supercomputer level, like a, I think a supercomputer of five years ago didn't have 21 teraops on it. So when we have supercomputer level of processing on each individual bottlenose camera or any other camera, that means that now you could envision having lots of them, right? And just because you have six cameras or 20 or 100 cameras in your factory, doesn't mean now you need 20 or 100 computers in order to work with it. And that used to be a very big limit, limit, uh, limiting factor, right? Because the, yes, the cameras are cheap, but when you add a computer to it and you add everything else around it, the infrastructure, IT has to get involved. There's ethernet lines everywhere. And before you know it, you have a you know large cluster or a server rack somewhere running your computer vision system. Now you don't need a lot of that, right? So just because you have uh, six cameras doesn't mean that the central computer has to be scaled up by six times. I mean, you're always free to do that if you wanted to run really, really high-end algorithms, but you don't have to, right? You could run it on anything, really. So um, that takes us to the integration question. And uh, so how do we how do we connect bottlenose to, let's say, a, uh, uh, something that we can find, find on the factory floor, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, because the, uh, because, you know, you can use our API that we provide, and you can ask the camera to do many different things. We also have a, uh, a web-based GUI, so you can log into the camera, and you'll get a, a, an HMI sort of interface where you can ask, where you can set it to do different things. Um, but let's say you do all of that. Now, what do we connect it to, right? And uh, and that really depends on what you've asked the camera to do. The most basic connection could be what we talked about earlier, which was point number three. You could just remove the computers and uh, and everything else completely. You could you could connect this and ignore the ethernet line on it. Uh, and you can connect it to a two channel digital IO, for example, and uh, just connect that directly into one of the terminal blocks on the PLCs. Okay. And, right? and then you can ask the camera to send out a signal on the digital IO, depending on a certain condition that it may see. And so let's say you train the camera to detect uh, detect a fault, or if you train the camera to detect a problem, then as soon as the camera sees that, it will be able to uh, put one of these digital outputs to a high or a low condition, depending on what you want it. And then you can connect this directly to your terminal block. And from there, you can, um, you, can you can use an actuator or a drive to turn a servo motor, whatever you want to do after, right? Okay, yep. But now let's say that you want to do something more advanced, right? And you want you want to take advantage of the dense depth and the feature points and all of this, but you also want to do some post-processing. Uh, you have a certain algorithm in mind um, that you, that's proprietary to you as the automation integrator or as the company, uh, and uh, maybe that is your secret sauce and how you're able to build that product so nice and so fast. Mm -hmm. Then you may want to go the Ethernet route. And uh, so we have a one gigabit Ethernet connection on all of uh, on all the bottom nodes, and so you can connect this directly. And let's say you could connect it to an industrial PC. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be the uh, probably the best choice. Uh, but you could also put it on some sort of next generation PLC as well. As I learned that uh, the new PLCs do have a lot of uh, very cool features coming up. Mm -hmm. um, actually, learned that through the automation block. So, uh, <laughs> so. If you have one of those PLCs that can take in gigabit Ethernet, and let's say they have Linux running on them and mm -hmm. have other things running on them, right? Um, then it's fair game. You could definitely use that and then use the uh, protocols that they provide in order to talk to bottomless and get the answers back that you're looking for. And the great thing is that in all of this integration, if you choose to, you never have to see an image. You know, I mean, yes, it's a camera, but it doesn't actually have to output any images if you don't want it to, right? So uh, sometimes the answers can be found just by the questions you've asked it. So if you've asked it to detect all the objects 
really, you don't need to see the image. You just need to know a stream of objects and where those objects are located, right? And, and that stream you could read, for example, over ethernet. Uh, let's say you can use Python on your next generation PLC or on an industrial PC. You can just uh, use our API and make that Python call and get those answers in, and then you can uh, do whatever you're doing after. Yeah, could you run down? I know our audio listeners uh, won't be able to see the slide. Can you kind of run down the different interfaces that an, a PC or a, or a, a PLC Next uh, Linux-based PLC would be able to utilize to talk to the camera? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, the uh, the primary one would be the gigabit Ethernet uh, that you could connect it to. So all the I think all the industrial PCs and the next PLC Next would have a gigabit Ethernet connection. Sure. Yep. And which is, I should clarify, which is to say that that's the max speed of the Ethernet. Sure. If you only have a 100 megabit Ethernet, that's fine too, yep. right? Um, in fact, that's probably more than enough if all you're getting is a stream of uh, where these objects are located. Then on your PLC Next or industrial PC, you can then make the call uh, using either Python or C, C++, and you can, uh, you can use various protocols like MQTT, 0MQ, or uh, RPC, like gRPC is a very common one. So you can use those protocols and, uh, and, and then we can pack that information that you're looking for through those protocols and into your application that you have over there. I think a lot of uh, developers would be, you know, familiar with the, you know, using the API, um, but MQTT has been very popular lately as well, yes. especially in IoT type applications. So it's good to see that that's supported as well. Yes, yes. And industrial IoT, you know, is coming up. And Kendra and I are actually writing a, uh, a tech brief on it as well. So that, oh, right. uh, that yes, yeah, so that white paper should be available soon. Uh, that will be published through the uh, Industrial IoT Consortium, the IAC. And uh, yeah, that will go into a little bit, uh, some, some detail on this as well. And uh, yeah, and if you guys have any questions on that, we'll be, we'll be happy to answer developer questions on what's coming. And uh, yeah, of course, and on the other side, you're free to use whatever, right? So uh, you could, and the camera itself runs Linux on it, but you're free to use uh, Linux on your PLC next. Uh, you can also use Windows on your industrial PC, right? And uh, you can write the programs as needed. A lot of this stuff is very cross-platform. Uh, these are the protocols and the lab and the programming language is very cross-platform, right? So. I was just gonna ask if you could go through the use cases you have on your slide um, yes. for the audio listeners here. Yeah, that sounds that sounds good. So the the first use case would be, you know, let's say uh, we want to just plug this into a PLC, and uh, and that will be through the digital I/O, and we don't have any uh, any other um, uh, program in the middle. Right, we have the the PLC's program, and so we're going to get the digital I/O signal into the PLC from where we're going to actuate something. So the first use case would be the collision warning lights, and let's say uh, we have our three D map that is being built inside the bottom loss and it kind of knows how close you are to certain things. So let's say your robot arm is moving or uh, or other things are coming uh, too close to the camera and uh, you want to raise a warning. Um, and we use the word warning because this is not a safety certified device. Uh, pretty much uh, no cameras are uh, you know uh, safety certified for this kind of application. But you could always have a collision warning light uh, that can be actuated by your PLC as soon as the 3D depth map and the AI detects something, right? So that'll be the first use case there. Yeah, and that's just, just for listeners that, I mean, you, you think, you know, most of your safety devices are going to shut down the process. So whether you have a mat on the floor or a light curtain, these are going to shut the process down. So having a warning light saying, hey, you're getting too close. If you get, you know, you may want to back up now because you're going to stop production. I mean, that that's, you can see the value in that, you know, yeah. uh, versus, you know, safety versus warning. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you're not affecting the flow rate of your factory when you're not shutting down. Yeah. And you're not, a, you know, like that's not a major block on what just happened, right? So if you can give users and workers a warning and that something is about to go wrong, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a lot of ROI that you could generate just from that investment there, right? And uh, you would still need the light curtains, right? If something, if somebody was to ignore the warnings and still approach the light curtain, you would still need that and that will still shut off. But uh, there's a lot you can do with just warnings first. Uh, then the next one would be the UGV and the AMR navigation use cases. And more and more, you're, you're seeing factories um, and the production floors having parts being shuttled across uh, using, let's say, AMRs or UGVs. And uh, this is the new form of a reconfigurable conveyor belt, so to speak, right? Because when you first install a conveyor belt, it's rigid. It, it does the one thing. But if you have an AMR, it can it can transport parts across more effectively and more efficiently. And uh, all AMRs and UGVs, and uh, you know, they, they do require some way of navigation. 
and some of them are very rigid. So they will have a, a tape on the factory floor or they'll have a magnetic rail or something. But the ones that are not rigid and are able to move around infrastructure free, uh, those do require cameras. And so for those, the bottlenose cameras is, is a great application. So if you're building those or if you're using those, uh, then you can use the bottlenose camera to figure out where your robot is. That's localization. Figure out what the world looks like around the robot. That's the 3D map and then figure out what you may what may not want to hit or maybe some things that you want to go over that's the ai piece of it could you talk a little bit about um because i know a lot of the real-time location systems uh, um they use either um rfid or bluetooth or wi-fi mm -hmm. this differs from that in you know in in a sense or could you explain how that may be more advantageous to use cameras than those other systems yeah, absolutely. Actually, I do have a section on that. Okay. Actually, that is that is the next slide. Yeah, that's a very very timely question there, Sean. Um, so as I mentioned at the very beginning, right? We have the uh, the bottomless product, and then we also have the product that is the network of these cameras. So if you have a few of them, you, you really just more than if you have two or more of these cameras, you can use our ICTN suite of uh, enhancements that we can do, just because we can see things now much more mm -hmm. clearly in the real world, right? Uh, this particular product is able to calculate the locations of everything that is in the field of view and is able to share across the uh, across the different cameras. And so we use AI and then we have a, a subsystem called the positioning engine. And that positioning engine actually figures out the, uh, the XYZ of that particular AI object that you wanted to detect. Right. So let's say in the example of the RTLS or in the example of the other other methods of localize, uh, localizing things, let's say a pallet. Mm -hmm. um, as the pallet travels across a factory, it will go out of the view of the one bottlenose. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, that's pretty much a certainty, right? There's going to be either a wall or there's going to be a shelf or something where the bottlenose, the view of one camera will get blocked at some point. If you could put a network of these cameras together uh, using our ICTN product, then we can track that pallet throughout the factory, and uh, and we can keep an ID of it. Like let's say we can uh, we can assign it a unique ID, and uh, and then we will know where it's going at all times. And the great thing about that is that you can now uh, track things without using tags, and you can get a very precise position of where they are because it's based on optic optical information and camera based information is very accurate. And um, you can use it for, let's say, you know, you wanted to do um, value chain analysis of how the raw material comes in and leaves. That would, that would be a very basic use case, right? And um, let's say it's on items that are very difficult to tag, uh, like uh, uh, like ore or uh, a powder or you know some sort of raw material that's coming in that's very difficult to track. But we could track it across uh, using using the ICTN system. Um, one of the examples uh, that Sean mentioned uh, is, is actually uh, also very good for ICT. And you could do that for both uh, what we were talking about earlier, which is the, uh, can we give a warning light for when somebody approaches uh, closer to a robot? Um, you could do that actually with just one bottlenose is good enough for that. Uh, but let's say it's a complicated environment and you have a lot of different blind spots and there's uh, um, you know areas where the camera cannot see beyond, beyond like there's a line of sight issue. Uh, then you can have multiple bottlenose units monitoring the same area, and uh, and then they can share that information. So let's say you have three of them, you're not going to get three warnings, right? Because that would be very annoying. If you had three cameras looking at the same area, you get three warnings would be <laughs> would be pretty useless. But if you had the ICTN system, we have the method to merge those into one track, right? So uh, the one person that is in the view of three different cameras will show up as one person on your map. And for the listeners that can, that are audio only, uh, we're basically showing a uh, a map on the screen right now around uh, an area around a robot arm, uh, where a red uh, a red circle shows the uh, what the area that is protected by the light curtain. So if you cross the red uh, barrier, uh, then your robot shuts down, your factory is off, and you know there's uh, there's issues, there's backup, and um, somebody's yelling at you, mm -hmm. but. If you have the other boundary, which is the blue boundary, which is a, basically a circle that's a larger diameter than the red circle, if you cross that circle, uh, then we can maybe give the warning, right? And uh, maybe the human can back out a little bit, but there are so many more possibilities that your listeners will know better how to use it, but you could also slow down the robot to, right, to prevent accidents or, to, or to just to prevent the chances of something bad happening. You could still continue doing your work, but the robot could just do it at a slower rate. 
Um, and uh, or uh, other thing, other examples could be boxes. You know, sometimes uh, let's say you're on a conveyor belt and you have parts and boxes and other things that need to go through the robot cell, and those things should not trigger the light curtain. So while you can position the light curtain in a way so that the box doesn't trigger it, but you could also use this system, right, where the AI allows those things to just pass through, and then um, and then uh, it has special warnings and special things when it sees a human, maybe. And like we mentioned before, using AI, you can ask the same system, the same ICTN system or bottlenose to detect uh, many different things that, that you can come up with. So like, let's say you're a furniture factory, you could use ICTN to have very specific alarms about when it sees certain kinds of wood or plywood or or hardwood being moved around the factory, right? So, or sections of a chair being moved around, and it could have different warnings and different behavior on whether it's the it's the back part of the chair, or whether it's the seat part, or whether it's the cushion. And uh, yeah, so uh, now we're showing a map on the screen. Basically, this map is the is what the output of the ICTN uh, piece looks like. It basically gives you like this view of a factory floor, uh, where you can then, uh, if you wanted to, you could train it to visualize all of your workers. Uh, if you can train it to visualize the AGBs uh, and the movement of product on a conveyor belt, and uh, and then you can use that for many things. The most basic thing you could use this for is, for example, time motion studies uh, to figure out how efficient you are. Everything is anonymized. So, you know, and uh, like we said, uh, um, these cameras aren't really um, outputting, when, when used as with ICTN, it's not outputting any images or saving anything either, right? So there really is no way to get to who that person is. Uh, it's just a dot on a map. You just know that there's somebody there. And yeah, that's it. That's uh, that's the end of uh, the two things too. And then, you know, to, to recap, basically we have the bottlenose, we have ICTN. Uh, Bottlenose makes a lot of sense for industrial automation, very high-end type of um, uh, processing and uh, computer vision algorithms that you can now deploy directly on the cameras. Well, I appreciate you going through all that. It's definitely extremely interesting uh, topic. Now, if somebody has a challenging application where they think this would probably be a good fit or maybe a good fit, how would they uh, get in touch with your company to talk about their application? Sure, yeah. Uh, we have uh, reps uh, that act as our sales reps across North America, but the best way for you would be to do contact at labforge.ca and okay. uh, you know reach out to us and we would be happy to uh, talk about your application and how we will uh, interface with, with what you're doing. Well, yes, sir. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and walking through that. Um, it's been a while since we did anything on Vision, so it was really good to go Thanks. into that and it it's, it's exciting to see how this is progressing so quickly and a lot of the new technologies we're seeing in other industries are, are coming into our own as well. So thank you again for coming on the show. No problem, Sean. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate you giving us the, the time on your podcast. Well, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I know I did. And I want to thank Yasser for coming on the show and bringing us all up to speed on the new technologies found in their cameras and also for making this episode of the Automation Podcast ad-free. With that said, if you're watching on YouTube or theautomationblog.com, please consider giving us a sub and a thumbs up. And if you're listening to the audio-only edition on iTunes or Google or Spotify or Pandora or TuneIn or iHeartRadio or somewhere else, please consider giving us a five-star review and subscribing because that really helps us reach more listeners as well as more presenters and i do want to thank those of you who already have done so really appreciate it that said that's the end of this episode of the automation podcast if you want to follow me or get in touch with me you can do so over at automation.locals.com and with that i want to wish you all a very safe happy and healthy week and until next time my friends peace <laughs>